So, um, Sir, start. Sir, start. Yes. All right. So, uh, good afternoon to all. We had a delayed start, uh, some technical lag with our devices. Uh, good afternoon to all assembled over the cyberspace. Respected patron, Mr. Ronajit Mondal, Honorable President, Governing Body, Kejuri College, Revered Principal, Dr. Oshim Kumar Manna, Chairman of the present event, Dignified Professor Catherine Cole of Liverpool John Moore University, UK, and University of Wollongong, Australia, Reverend Dr. Joydeep Sharangi, Principal, New Alipur College, Kolkata. Respected Dr. Gautam Dandopat, Coordinator, IQSE, Kejuri College. Members of the Governing Body and IQSE. All the assembled dignitaries from various parts of the country and abroad. Principals, professors, staff members, researchers, and dear students. On behalf of the Department of English, Kejuri College, I, Rongit Shengupto, welcome you all to this online talk, conversation, and reading session on poetry, organized by the Department of English, Kejuri College, in collaboration with IQSE. Now, before beginning, I would request you all to please mute your microphones and your uh, your video if you are on google meet platform and unmute yourself only when you are speaking and please desist from presenting out here so we all await what promises to be a fascinating talk on poetry by professor cole and her subsequent conversations with dr sharungi which will be followed by Professor Cole's readings of her own poems. I would now request Mr. Uh, Ronajit Mondol, Honorable President, Governing Body, Kejuri College, and our Chief Patron to inaugurate this event by sharing a few words with us. Respected Mr. Mondol, please, please, sir. Namaskar, Namaskar. college the college <laughs> Principal side, Program on Sukron Correction. There are Bishes Corre, there are on now in Mass City King of College Trigger I Session, Tadar Pokyama, Honova, J. Povitar Motodi, on a kitchen cook of the Bakon and Scovitar Motodi. Sorry, Sir, Tami. Pepper to Sulu, 
আপনাদের বিভিন্ন প্রোগ্রাম চলছে কয়েকদিন ধরে ওয়েবনার চলছে এটা একটি অন্য টাইপের ওয়েবনার এটা আমি মনে করি এটা একটা অন্য মাত্রা যোগ করেছে আমাদের কলেজের এই ওয়েবনার গুলো আপনি আমাদের সঙ্গে থাকবেন আপনার বিজি শিডিউল থাকা সত্ত্বেও আই উড নাও রিকোয়েস্ট ডক্টর অসীম কুমার মান্না রেভার্ড প্রিন্সিপাল খেজুরি কলেজ হু উইল গ্রেস দ্য প্রেজেন্ট ইভেন্ট অ্যাজ চেয়ারম্যান টু ডেলিভার আ ওয়েলকাম অ্যাড্রেস টু অল অ্যাসেম্বলড ডক্টর মান্না প্লিজ প্লিজ টেক ওভার ওকে ওকে Welcome Honorable President Welcome, Mr. Donald Mondo of our and of other Honorable Members of Governing Body, two Honorable Speakers, Prof. Catherine Cole of uh, John Moore's University of Liverpool and Dr. Sarongi, New Alipur College, Prof. Rongi Sengupta, HOD of English Department, Prof. Gautam Dondopat, coordinator IPSC Khejuri College, all other dignitaries, participants from several institutes and my beloved students and dear colleagues. It gives me immense pleasure to note that today Professor Kole has chosen to talk on poetry and read some of her poems. I am also happy to note that Dr. Sarangi will engage in a conversation with her on her poems, how they were born and perhaps also about her academic work. I am a student of science and as I such, it is assumed that people of rigorous scientific temp temper neglect the emotions embedded in poems. However, my coexistence with plants, animals and birds has often drawn me into the magical world of sounds and words. As a naturalist, I have realized how an invisible wave connects us all through uh, resonances that only poems can hint at. Today, in these COVID times, when we encounter imbalances in the cycle of nature, the sensibility of a poet as much as the analysis of a scientist can save us from catastrophe. I welcome you all to this talk and I am personally curious to listen to Professor Kole and Dr. Soreng. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manna, for your words of inspiration. I'm personally acquainted with your love for poetry and how it overlaps with your love for trees birds, fish, squirrels. Uh, I will now humbly request Dr. Manna to permit me to introduce Professor Cole and Dr. Sharangi. May I, sir? Should I proceed, Dr. Manna? Okay, okay you proceed, okay, please. Proceed. Thank you, thank you, sir. So Professor Catherine Cole, has been an eminent academic, writer, and critic. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She's presently professor at Liverpool John Moores University, UK, and also 
an honorary professorial fellow at the University of Wollongong, Australia. She's an accomplished poet, natural novelist, short story writer. She has published four novels and a short story collection. Her academic interests focus on colonial and post-colonial histories of Vietnam and Australia, crime fiction, fashion, and migration studies. Her work on the great Australian poet, A.D. Hope, has been of seminal importance, and the rec recollections of her friendship with the poet and his mentorship is described quite touchingly in her book, The Poet Who Forgot. Her passion for unfamiliar words, for fading words and evanescent sounds and smells of cities and birds, her love of poetry and her explorations of poetic lives. I'm sure she will touch on all these on the course of this particular talk. After Professor Cole's talk, Dr. Joydeep Sharangi will take over and he has kindly agreed to engage in a conversation with Professor Cole. Dr. Joydeep Sharangi is principal, New Alipur College, Kolkata. He has been well-known post-colonial critic, poet, editor, interviewer, translator. His explorations of Dalit literary movements in India has been path-breaking, especially her work, his work on Monohar Moli Bishash, Jyotin Bala, Basavraj Naikar, among others. Dr. Sharangi has written extensively on Indian English and Australian poetry, especially on the work of Joyanto Mohapatra. He is himself an accomplished poet. Theodore Adorno had remarked that after the horrors of Auschwitz, there can hardly be any lyricism left in poetry. Yet, as the 20th century transitioned into the 21st, we have realized, not without an uncanny note of surprise, that poetry has this curious knack of surviving on margins of what Owen had termed superhuman inhumanities. This is hardly a revelation for some who had survived in colonial and oppressed presents and pasts. Australian bush ballads, African-American work songs, Lingayat Vachanas, Kabir's Dohas, Welsh coal miners' verses, poetry has survived that darkest hour of discrimination, brutality, and demolition. Paul Celan and Nizam Hikmat, Miwash and Vladimir Hulan, Joyanto Mohapatro and the Mercy Beat poets, among others, have affirmed to the persistence of poetry in the post Auschwitz era. Today, when the ironies of a globalized and yet a deeply divided world order enmesh us in this ongoing COVID crisis, we eagerly wait. Uh, Professor Cole elaborating on poetry, poetry, that precarious yet vital recourse in these dystopic times. I would uh, request participants to post relevant questions on YouTube Live and Google Meet platforms, some of which Professor Cole and Dr. Sharangi would address after Professor Cole's readings. I'd once again request Professor Cole to please, please deliver her talk. And Dr. Sharangi to please uh, continue after the talk with the conversation. Professor Cole, please, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for such a warm welcome. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and talking to you today. And, and also it's caused me to um, think a lot about my younger self, which to some degree, the book about um, A.D. Hope, the poet who forgot, uh, is. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But um, I thought I'd begin by just talking uh, firstly about poetry and the way in which I think most people, not just people who become writers, but most people um, learn from poems from a very young age. 
I think as children, we're very, very drawn to those magical rhythms and word plays and the ways in which stories are told through poetry. I think it, it, it's a natural thing in us, a natural uh, vibration or plucked string. And we see it in our children and the children we may teach or um, have uh, associations with how much they love that capacity to enjoy words. There used to be uh, a saying in education that one of the greatest um, disadvantages of teaching children is that you somehow through uh, curriculum and enforced studies of things often that children um, aren't comfortable with or feel doesn't speak to them directly and we somehow kill that that natural tendency to be poetic and I think that's an interesting point in terms of how we stay with poetry and how it continues to excite and engage us as we become young adults. As a writer, I think one of the most significant things for me is that as a child and, and certainly as a teenager and a young adult, my first form of writing was poetry. I found poetry um, intrinsically interesting it was something that I could play with, the words I enjoyed stringing together or rhythms or rhymes. And uh, for many writers, I think that first step, even if they don't remain a poet or truly singly a poet, um, is that capacity to feel at ease with words and, and free to do what you like with poetry. My own education was a fortunate one in that I grew up at a time where poetry was studied widely in schools and still um, engaged in a whole range of other ways with, um, with a childhood experience. So often um, when I was about 10 or 11, um, we would listen to a poem and the teacher would get us to um, illustrate it which was always fascinating to me, a kind of a, a forerunner, if you like, of multimedia um, studies and so on. But for children to engage with poetry, the, the capacity to then visualise, literally visualise on the page with paints and crayons and pencils was an additional um, characteristic to poetry that I found very interesting and that carried me into my adult years when I began writing poetry. And my poetry always has had a, a storyteller quality and I think I've also all, all sought the visual very actively. Some of my early uh, poetry, the sorts of things kids liked a lot, were those poems that told a story about mythological figures or, or uh, people, highwaymen or, or characters that were doing something. Was, you know, poems like The Lady of Shalott, for example. We, these were all things that that engaged me very much and I loved listening to them because they were telling me a story but in an unusual and abstract way in which the words did things that took the story into a, a different dimension. So perhaps knowing that it's not a surprise that when I got to university and I started studying poetry through various um, courses in my English literature degree that it was always interesting to think about who the poets were and what they had done with these um, forms and, and how they advanced poetry from, from the classicists through to the modernists and postmodernists. And one of the things that struck me as I finished my degree was how privileged I'd been to study some Australian poets, particularly poets like Kenneth Slesser and A.D. Hope. And I thought a nice thing to do might be to write to to them and say thank you very much. I really appreciate the fact you wrote those poems and I had the opportunity to study them. And so Kenneth Slesser had died, so he wasn't really available to write to and say thank you, but A.D. Hope was alive. And I thought a nice thing to do would be to write to A.D. Hope and say thank you very much for your poems, I enjoyed them. And I did that. And I was very surprised when he actually wrote back and said, oh, thank you. I, uh, it's nice to get a letter from someone who's enjoyed the poems. And if ever you're in Canberra, please come and visit me and let me know you're there. Now, I, can, I will talk at length you know, about A.D. Hope and meeting him because I think 
one of the things when you are a, a new writer or someone who's beginning a career as a writer is you're slightly in awe of writers as well. You don't really expect them to reply to your letters, but also, uh, you know, what is it to be a writer and to live a writer's life? The person I am now and the academic career I have is very, very different to who I was. When I finished my university degree, I was working as I studied. And so my studies were always balanced with my life, um, working as a civil servant and studying part time. So all of these things seemed rather out of reach to me and rather romantic and idealistic which to some degree sat with my visions of poets as people who starved in attics or, or had these um, rather colourful lives. And so to hear from A.D. Hope was, was a surprise in the sense that um, I knew he lived in Canberra, um, which is not really quite the sort of city you would imagine a poet living in, in a way. It certainly wasn't somewhere like Paris or, or Garrett in London. Um, and he lived a fairly middle class life. He was an academic and had a very nice house, as I found out later, in, um, in a nice suburb in Canberra. And so for me, this challenged also my idea of creative practice and what it means to be, to be a, a poet and, and, and living the world of poetics. Can the world of poetics be lived while you're also writing government policy in a government office? Um, well, T.S. Eliot's, I suppose, showed us you can write fabulous poetry while also working in a bank. So I can't imagine why not. But at the time, it felt quite a, a radical discovery for me that to be a writer can be also um, mean being a whole lot of other things as well. So what drew me to his poetry? And what drew me to poetry in general? Well, I've talked a bit about those ways in which the words challenge us and mock us and do all sorts of things with narrative and ideas and draw on the past and push the boundaries of the future and ask us to engage in a conversation with poets. All the sorts of things that have been mentioned today, birds and nature, plants, love, death, the great themes of our lives. All of those things are significant in poetry, but they also can be very simple things as well, like watching a bird land on a branch or a cat play with a ball of wool. These sorts of things allow us to draw on and reflect on the things that matter most to us or that just touch us in a moment. When I contacted A.D. Hope, um, the letter, I popped inside a book as a bookmark and promptly lost it. So it was some years later when I happened to be working in Canberra that I wrote to A.D. Hope again. And I said to him, you probably don't remember me, but I wrote to you some years ago and you said, if ever I'm in Canberra, please come and visit you. And surprise, surprise, he immediately wrote back again and said, yes, please come and have dinner with us and meet my wife, Penelope. And I did um, get in touch and I went to meet him first at the ANU where he was working. And in the poet, we forgot I talk a bit about this, the idea of somehow going to meet somebody out of the blue in a, in a university academic office. The night before, I'd been to see a film. I can't even remember the name of the film now. It was a French film and it was one of those art house films that was on in a cinema in Canberra. But what was significant about the film uh, was that the academic in it, there was an academic character, uh, spoke about the French Renaissance poet, Louise Labay, and I had never heard of her. And the film impressed me because the academic in it was reading from her works and they were rather wonderful sonnets angry sonnets about a woman whose lover had rejected her and that formed part of the narrative of the film but I when I met A.D. Hope the next day I said to him have you ever heard of a poet called Louise Labay a French woman poet and of course he had A.D. Hope had heard of just about every poet on the planet that I then found out and it was quite lovely to sit down in his office 
he provided some sandwiches and a glass of wine and and uh, coffee and so on and we talked for about four or five hours about poetry and particularly about Louise Labay and he lent me a copy of her work and and so on so that meeting was remarkable and I think now when I I reflect back on it how privileged it is not only to be um, the beneficiary of such generosity but to be able to you know metaphorically sit at the foot of a great poet who also happens to be a very interested and caring individual who was took quite within his stride that some person was writing to him saying can we meet and catch up and talk about poems i would probably be less um, inclined to do that now in a way than i was when i was much much younger after that i started meeting with ad hope on a fairly regular basis while i was in canberra and i went to dinner at his house in can in um, manica and at the dinner there were a range of people which um, to my starry-eyed youth seemed a pretty remarkable in in its own right there was uh, the poet david brooks who was a fine scholar on hope um, and and a number of other civil servants and academics and and so on and we sat around that dinner table for hours just talking and about all sorts of things not just poetry and that was revelatory too because poets don't just talk about poetry they talk about politics and they talk about wine and they talk about their families and they talk about um, fiction and all sorts of television programs and so on and it made me realize also just how sort of widely skilled A.D. Hope was and how interested he was in the world. By then, he was a man of about 77. And so hearing him talk about all of these other things made me realise that even though much of his poetry was, was, was uh, grounded, if you like, in classical um, literature, in stories about Ulysses or uh, biblical um, references like lot and his daughters and so on um, he was a man also who could hold his own about doctor who or um, what was happening in australian politics at the time and i think that was fabulous he also seemed very young and i love that idea that we all as we get older become in a way more and more engaged with with or we hope to anyway with our younger selves and also um, young people i think academics often feel this that we can feel slightly like vampires sometimes. We, we draw on the youth and enthusiasm and learn from our students all about cultural things that perhaps are not currently in our ambit, but we, we, learn, we learn from that. And I think that capacity to be wide ranging is very, very important. Uh, A.D. Hope used to come up and visit me in Sydney and um, you know he would, he would stay and, and go off to the ABC and do various programs and so on. I had a cat at the time. He was very fond of the cat and he had a couple of cats himself, Moek and, and um, um, Abyssinia, who uh, were the loves of his life. Uh, I could talk on and on about this. So I suppose what I should say is that this went on for years. You know, we talked, wrote letters, the letters, um, most of them are in the poet who forgot. And they show a young person who is, I suppose, aware of the privilege of, of writing to someone like this and sharing poems. He would look at my poems and tell me how to fix them very kindly, I have to say, and encourage me to get them published and so on. And we also talked about um, other poets and maybe even working together on a book of women poets, which unfortunately didn't happen, but we often would have a conversation about someone like Anna Akhmatova, the Russian poet and so on. And this also opened my eyes to other poem, poets as well, people I hadn't happened on. And he had a vast library in his house and I sometimes minded his house when he was uh, away and I would read things that I hadn't uh, encountered before. And I think that's very, very important too in the world of, of being a poet, just how you um, explore, how you can sometimes just catch a sentence of poetry, something that stands in a line of poetry somewhere it happens into your life through film, through radio, through someone else's passion. And I think that's 
that's a very important aspect of poetry that the way it's like a plucked string that that engages with us through centuries and through cultures and also through somehow being made aware of the magic of the words in a context perhaps in which you hadn't expected to encounter them so you might find a poem by hd or or um i don't know browning Hear, hearing someone read it on on a tape or a radio program um, suddenly makes you much much more aware of of it and and it, it finds its way into your into your world as a as a teenager i um i encountered a poem i think by hilda doolittle um where the last line is take her head upon your knee say to her my dear my dear it is not so dreadful here and it was about persephone and her uh, being drawn into the underworld and it also resonated of course with all my adolescent angst and the those moments in your life when poems somehow speak to you directly of your own personal experience uh, people would be aware i imagine that ad hope uh, developed dementia in his old old age and he forgot that he was a poet and I find that when I tell that story to my students, they find that deeply poignant and as it is, that someone who could have created remarkable poems um, would forget that they had written them or that they were even a poet and spend their last years in a, a kind of care home where other people didn't know who they were because they didn't know who they were themselves. And there is, in a way, that's why the book became an imperative for me to write. I felt somehow that I wanted to capture what that meant. The other uh, aspect of the book was, it also was a shock to me when I discovered my letters that I had written to Aidy Hope were being stored in his archive in the Australian National Library. And so to some extent, the book is a, a reaction to finding yourself preserved. He had put a 50 year embargo on the letters, not that there was anything in them that the public couldn't read, but I felt that was a very interesting aspect of him in his life too, that he um, was mindful of other people's privacy, even though I had his letters and had talked to people and so on about um, my encounters with him. And so my book in a way was a tribute to him and his generosity, but the sadness also of his losing his memory. And to a degree, a, an embarrassment for myself that I wanted to explore that a young person does these things just suddenly out of blue rights to a poet. So that, that to some extent sums up my engagement with him. I could talk about sitting in the lounge room and before a crackling fire with Penelope and Alec and just talking about literature and, and poems and then going away and writing not always just poetry but but prose as well um, influenced by those those um, discussions and so these influences stay with you all your life and they shape who you are and they shape what you write and even now when I write poems, these poems resonate with other poems. So some of the things I'm going to read later come from conversations or books or happen encounters. Stylistically, um, A.D. Hope was seen as sometimes um, challenging in the sense that poems like um, Australia challenge people with its brutality of, of reference. But poems like The Death of the Bird are endlessly um, emotionally engaged. The way in which he captured aspects of life and death in something about a bird flying off course. And when I spoke to him about that poem, I said, where did the idea come from? It's such a small idea and such a grand idea at the same time and he talked about how once when he was in 
America, he was walking um, somewhere down south and towards the Gulf of Mexico and saw a great swathe of birds fly in past, you know, as they do starlings or, or sparrows or birds that migrate south. And he saw one bird, as the birds swung around to the right, he saw one bird just keep going ahead. And he knew in seeing that bird go ahead in the way it did, that it would not survive, that over the, over the gulf it would run out of energy or steam and would plunge into the, the sea. And there is something so beautiful in that image and so sad also. It's about us as well and our lives and that one day we will go off over the sea and plunge. And he captures that so beautifully and so poetically. I love other poems too. I love the way in which the end of the journey, um, for example, he captures that great, great myth of the return of Ulysses and the, the realization that the, the journey is over. And as we get older, um, I think that kind of reflection comes to us in a whole lot of ways. So the way he captured that through classical, through classical literature or through mythological stories, and yet brought with it that humanitarian concern about what it's like when we no longer journey freely around the world having adventures because we, we get old and we come back home. All these poems have formed part of my life and it was such a, a thrill to be able to talk about them with him. But oddly, Alex didn't always talk about his own poems. He liked talking about other people's poems and he was a great mentor to other poets, the Australian poet Julian Croft. Or, um, he talked about poets who just landed in his lounge room drinking wine studying or living at the moment or visiting the ANU or, or Canberra. So those kinds of conversations about other poets as well were very important to him. But poems like Meditation on a Bone, we, we look at these and we just see this voice traveling through through time and the way the poem captures that 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 story of the the anger of the the the, the, the lines written on a bone and how he thinks of that. And then, of course, in the killer last line, uh, whether anyone will ever think of him in, in, this, in, in the same way. So I might stop there because I think I've, I've spoken for 20 minutes or so and it might be time to um, talk more in conversation, but um, certainly about the poet who forgot, but about other aspects of A.D. Hope and his life too and his influence on me. I am just eternally grateful for having had that opportunity to spend time with a generous person and his, his wife Penelope and his cats and his house and just that feeling you get of privilege um, that, that you are moving in, a, in the circle or the orbit of someone who, who has done wonderful things with words and yet has no qualms about sharing them and discussing them and being open to your conversation um, and concerns as well. And I think that I wouldn't be who I am now without having had that capacity to discuss um, writing with, with A.D. Hope. Thank you. Wonderful, Kathy. And uh, it touched our hearts because when we were uh, the students, Eddie Hope meant a lot. And uh, your primary interactions with Eddie Hope meant a lot for all of us. Thank you for sharing a lot about Eddie Hope. I know it's a moment to recall what had happened and uh, what made him so great and so generous that he could give shelter to so many poets and poetess, uh, not only from Australia, but also from different parts of the world. I know in one of my interviews with Jayanta Mahapatra, Jayanta Mahapatra said he visited Eddie Hope and Penelope uh, in uh, their residence at uh, uh, Canberra. And uh, he can remember how uh, 
uh, how they interacted uh, about poetry for a long duration and long time, and which initiated talks on uh, poetry from the Commonwealth as well, I think, which is monumental and historical in many sense of the development of in the Indian poetry in English, as well as world poetry. Great contribution. Thank you, Kathy. Can we start with one thing that uh, possibly some years back, the interview that I took with you uh, for a big Australian journal from Flinders, uh, where you you mentioned that Edu Hope was a classicist and uh, a man who believed in form and style. So do you have any particular reference about him that claiming him as a classicist? I'm using the word classicist quite widely, I think, here, and I'm using it in the sense of both style, um, you know, a kind of iambic pentameter and rhyme and rhythm and, and, and so on, but also in his use of subject matter. And then one of the things that has been um, commented on with A.D. Hope was his there's not many references to Australia in his poems. You know, for a man who grew up in, uh, was born in Cooma, lived in Tasmania, or lived in Sydney, went to Oxford, but came back and so on, and then moved to Canberra and was quite, you know, uh, passionate about the Australian landscape. When you talk to him about this, you know, the Canberra is so close to the snowy mountains and ringed by a beautiful countryside and so on, um, that there wasn't that much that you would call deeply and intrinsically Australian. And this was criticised by, by, by people who felt he was clinging to um, references, classical, mythological references and so on. And I've often wondered why, I think it was partly because of his his passion for these 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 topics, and also his interest in um, the the sort of Augustan poets, people like Dryden, and so on. But um, I I don't know. I just think he he was his his own self in that regard. He wasn't going to be drawn into ways of writing that he didn't wish to to write. So, so for me, uh, that 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 definition and loose de definition covers both style and and, and um, subject matter. He also wrote a lot about sex, and this also was um, contentious. You know, especially when you look at his poetry in the context of social movements of the '60s and '70s, feminism, and so on. So I look at his poems today, I'm, I'm teaching a subject on mythology and genre for LJ and you this semester. And I was thinking, gosh, there's so many poems I could get the students to read and in the context of, you know, Ulysses and um, Penelope, or, you know, the bi biblical stories like Lot and his daughters and so on. But um, I, I know the students were really confronted sometimes by that sexuality and the the male view of sexuality. The women are often quite grossly overemphasized, you know, their, their thighs, their bodies and so on. So I think that also ran slightly counter to what was, was happening at the time as well. They're, they're, they, these are images of, of Rubens paintings in a way or or, or the Australian painter Norman Lindsay, they're, they're slightly anachronistic in which women are, don't always in his poems have, have voice. And again, that's because they, they sit more comfortably in that notion of the, the mythological and symbolic. So to me, that, that would be more how I would define my reference, if you like. Wonderful. And uh, if you recall, if you could recall, who were A.D. Hope's favourite authors? Now that's a difficult one. I was thinking about that this morning. You know, I was thinking, all right, you know, Andrew Marvell, 
Athena, Dryden, or Pope, or <coughs> excuse me, and Yates, and Keats. These were all people he would talk about and and and, and read and, and so on and, and 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 but but he was also so wide ranging in terms of his own reading. It may not have um, necessarily uh, made him want to uh, experiment or reflect in in a particular way on that kind of writing. But he he was very interested in you know poetry of my tipping or you know, Australian mm. writers who were doing different mm. things. I, I, I think he was constantly curious about writers and writing. And I think mm. that's a really important quality for writers to have, and for poets to have. Um, that, that metronomic and musical quality to poetry was, was always there too. He was influenced by by the he, he listened to a lot of music and classical music and so on and i think all of these things were passions for him so i don't know that i could easily say you know it was so and so and so and so i think he he was if you drew his attention to someone he, he was fascinated or if he if you thought you'd discovered someone and mentioned that you were usually disappointed to find he already knew much much more about these <laughs> Than you did. So to me, that 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 marks him, and it also marks him as even though he was seventies, eighties when I when I was uh, friendly with him, um, he to me had the curiosity and the intellectual stamina of someone who never ages. Mm. Wonderful and. Uh... How about satires? Because I think Katie Hope uh, is one of the premier poets, global poets, who used satire perfectly. Just I'm um, reading a couple of lines from, I remember, from the poem Australia. A woman beyond uh, her change of life, her breast still tender but within the womb is dry, without songs, architecture, history, he is talking about Australia and the poem Australia. So how come he becomes so uh, important a poem of satire? It's an odd poem, Australia, because people, you know, critics will often use it as an example of his antipathy to the country. But I asked him about this once, you know, he'd come back from Oxford with a not particularly good degree, he only got a third, but I don't think he was particularly engaged with his studies. He wanted to live and be, um, be free uh, to, to explore and, and wander a bit. And um, the, the feeling I had from the way he described that was that when he came back, he was quite unsure really about, about Australia. And I think that cultural cringe that was common in Australia right through up until almost the 70s and the, the change in Australia um, with the Whitlam years. I think that um, that antipathy or that, that cringe that was common in Australia, who were we? Yeah. What was the country? Why, why, what was its identity? Mm -hmm. and, the, the brutality of those lines in that poem, the, like, like the ones you've read, are, mm. are scathing and nasty, really. And also, you know, the idea mm. that a country is a, a woman, you know, past her prime and all these things. I think it just reflects a, a sense in himself of what he'd come back to, but also what, what the country felt about itself to some yes. degree. I think Australia has taken a long time and still is struggling with, with what it is because it's a vast place and it's an indigenous country. It has, it has an indigenous past that has not been fully examined or reflected on or reconciled. I mean, it was it's a stolen country, you know, the British came and took it colonialism for you go around the world stealing places 
And I think those sorts of things were were deep in the uh, deep in the Australian psyche that that, that people came there mm. and were taken there as convicts, and then came there to escape something else, and in doing that, massacred and settled and. That, that idea in that poem of that vast, dry centre, it's about a, a, a dry, hard heart mm. to some extent, I think, in a more contemporary reflection on it, a, a, a dry, hard heart towards the people who originally had the place. It was theirs. But then toward, at the end of the poem, there is um, a reconciliation to some degree. He's not saying that Europe is that much better, you know, <laughs> the chattering apes of Europe and so on. <laughs> and so it, to, to me, it's more a cry for an understanding of who we are and what we need to be. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that he was the forerunner in establishing literary studies at Australian universities, mm -hmm. there's something of his answer to that poem. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's 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 a poem worth visiting and revisiting and reflecting on in a, in in such a wide context: cultural, political, colonial, that's, artistic. That's yeah. yeah. So many things in the poem. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Which poem of Eddie Hope you like most? Oh gosh. <laughs> I think there must be, the list is huge. Maybe yeah. one poem. Uh, maybe one poem you choose. It's a hard one, isn't it? It's like when, when people ask you this, it's like poetry. I like The Death of the Bird, obviously. It's a very beautiful poem to me. And I worked on a series of programs with um, a woman uh, from the ABC where we, we had, um, we did a, a documentary, a, a radio documentary on the, the death of the bird with various people talking about what it meant to them, mm. uh, either in Dick and David Brooks and so on. Mm. I love that, 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 that poem very much, but I like meditation on a bone. I, I love the idea that poetry speaks to, not a, you know, to us creatively and um, artistically. At, 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 at that moment of taking an object and reflect, reflecting on it 900 years later, I think it's a, a very beautiful poem. Imperial Adam, I mean, yeah. I'm pulling out all sorts here. I, yeah. I was thinking of, you know, whenever I'm thinking of things that, that my students would enjoy with me. I think that's one of the great joys of teaching is you'd know that you, you have this common pleasure in reading something and having your students read it and, and enjoy it with you or, or even, you know, not enjoy it and tell you why. I think that kind of engagement's important. So Imperial Adam and the end yeah. of the journey. I mean, I've mentioned these earlier, but the end of the journey I, I like very much. I always think it was quite no accident that um, Lady Hope's wife was called Penelope. <laughs> she herself was a, she loved to sew and, 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 uh, and, and to visit their house sometimes where she was set, sort of patiently sitting there and sewing. Always made me think of the mythological Penelope as well. Yeah. <laughs> but they're just some anyway. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, many people who visited Lady Hope's residence in Canberra they, everyone uh, spoke high of Penelope and uh, Eddie Hope's wife, and uh, they remember uh, their great time together in Canberra. Most of the Indian artists and the, the Australian artists whom I had familiarity. So, how how did you find Eddie Hope's house as a storehouse of knowledge, knowledge about poetry for you? Um. The thing I found very interesting about their house was Canberra, you know, as you know, was a suburb that was very designed and it was, um, it was, it was designed in a very particular way around sort of circular yeah. roads and so on. And in a way, the, the house, the houses there conform to that to a high degree. It's all very beautifully um, ordered. But there, Penelope and, and, and um, Alex House was uh, it, it, the, 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 the street face of the house was where the kitchen and uh, hallway and so on were. So the house that you saw as you entered from the street was really like the back of the house. 
And they did that because they had a large, a very large block of land. It was almost double the size, I think, of a normal suburban block. And so the front of the house, if you like, was, the, was that part, that, the back that overlooked the garden. And it was a very pretty garden and it was full of fruit trees and birds and, 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 and a back veranda that overlooked it. And when you walked in, you were just aware of a kind of welcoming feel to the house. And I love writers' houses. I, I don't know if other people have this interest as well, but um, my niece once gave me a book called Writers' Houses where you went into the house, photographed house of various writers, from Marguerite Durard, and, and you saw the sort of creative clutter of their lives. Mm. There were some who had very neat houses, but, but in general, writers seemed to me like a bit of chaos around them, piles of books and, and so on. Eddie Hope's house was very tidy, but it had lots of books and in his study walls and walls of books and a desk that looked into the garden. And um, there, it was also a house where things were used. Again, they were probably like a lot of their generation and now, of course, um, it, it's a skill we are all, all um, needing and that was they recycled everything as far as I could see. They were people who didn't throw things away. So their crockery, if it had a chip in it, they wouldn't throw it away. They just use it, and, and um, they they struck me as people who for for whom things were precious, and they kept them. And their daughter had died, um, which was a great source, obviously, of sadness to them. And she was a a jewelry maker and artist, and so there were beautiful things of hers around the house. So yes, it was a house where you felt welcome and comfortable and also intellectually pulled into something. Conversations, books. I love houses like that. And when they went overseas sometimes, they'd ask me would I mind it, and I did mind it once when they were away, I think only a couple of weeks, but, you know, they, they, to be in that house was to be, you know, it resonated with poetics. And I felt, you know, that was that was very nice experience. Thank you. Coming from any book to uh, the poet and the writer, academic Catherine Cole of today. So, uh, no, could you please tell us uh, uh, who is Catherine Cole originally? He is. A, she is an essayist. She is a short story writer. She is a novelist. She is a poet. She is a biographer. And uh, she is, uh, uh, is a researcher on crime fiction and what not. She is a specialist on French colonialism in Vietnam and so many. Who is the real, real Catherine Cole for the readers? <laughs> One thing I always say to my students, because they all, uh, you know, they're all fledgling writers too, is that, you know, it's both a blessing and a curse in a way to write in a range of different forms and genres because I, I believe in being as free creatively as I can, which means sometimes I might write poems and sometimes I might write a novel or short story, but it drives your agent or your publisher crazy because they can't just fit you neatly into a category. And um, but, but for me, it's always been that I want to write all sorts of things so I, I accept the fact that, you know, I'm not going to develop a, a name as a specific kind of writer. Not, I don't think so anyway. I'm, I do all sorts of things. Um, and I think that that's a very liberating way to approach your own work. That sometimes a poem is a much better way to say what you want to say than a novel. But sometimes if you have a sustained idea in a different way, you need to write it as a long prose piece. And my short stories, I explored uh, the book, the collection, um, Seabirds Crying in the Harbour Dark, was about being a refugee, I mean, in, in all forms of the word. So I was quite interested then in exploring a, a social and political phenomenon about people being homeless or lost or seeking asylum um, through a whole lot of interconnected short stories. <laughs>
So it's very difficult for me to answer who I am. I think I'm very confused in myself. <laughs> <life. laughs> but I also don't think that's going to change because I also like writing cre um, creative nonfiction as well. And I would, I always advise my students, look, if, if, you know, if you want to be a famous for writing only crime novels, stay with it and keep writing them. If you want to be a poet, that's really what you want and only what you want, then please stay with poetry, em embrace it and enjoy it and write it. But if you want to do all sorts of things, don't let anyone tell you not to. So for me, I came... I come from a background, my parents were British migrants to Australia. They were working class people. Um, they did instill in us as children a real love of books. And so from a very early age, we were read to, uh, we had books every Christmas and birthday, we were given books. We were encouraged to go to libraries and I'm a big advocate for people's access to public, public libraries. And I think like a lot of writers at a very young age, I thought, wow, I wish I could do that. And so school through writing compositions and stories encouraged us to do that and I've never stopped. And I think, you know, I always will want to write something. And it's becoming an academic almost became a a natural course to work and write at the same time. But but I had been before that a civil servant. I worked in uh, human rights and equity and diversity areas. And then I um, did my doctor. I did an MA on James Joyce and George Moore. And then I did my PhD on crime fiction. And then I started to pu get published. And I won um, a, a residency in Paris through the Australia Council for the Nancy Kiesing studio in Paris for six months. And also in um, Vietnam, I received a residency. So once I started to achieve those sorts of things, um, I felt very much more that I was a writer and becoming an academic felt like a good thing to do. Um, and just on lastly on Vietnam, I, as, a, as a young, as a teenager, I was very anti the Vietnam War and took part in protests. And so Vietnam was sort of seared into my consciousness. And I went there because I was curious about its history in the Vietnam War with America and Australia and New Zealand and so on. But also because the French had been there as well and the colonial architecture interested me very much. So there you go, all sorts of things. <laughs> I think that's why you came out of the book, The Grave at the Blue Lane isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. And that book talks about French colonialism in Vietnam so much. And you showed me a copy when I was at your university a few years, uh, some years yeah. ago. Yeah, wonderful book, wonderful book. I took one phrase from your uh, last answer uh, to stay with the uh, poetry. Can writing poetry be taught at all? It's a bit like that question we ask, and creative writers are constantly asked, you know, can you teach writing? Mm. It's, it's a difficult one. Because I think for anyone who wants to write, I always feel they have to read. You have to be a reader to be a writer. But then having said that, I have students sometimes who hardly read anything, but they read in different ways. They read through music or film or television or social media and so on. Sometimes it drives me nuts because I want them to read things that I, I love and I want them to see the words on the page. But on another level, I think, well, people must have their own texts and their own passions about about writing and reading. Can we teach them? I think we can teach people techniques. But I think you you need to think deeply to be a writer. And I think, you, you know, sometimes philosophically, you need people to engage or, or challenge themselves about the world. So teaching writing, I think you can teach people to write better and to yeah. edit and to think about how better to do something.
Um, I think creative writing courses. I'm, I'm, I'm being careful here in a way because it's a political answer. Mm. I can often tell in a class very quickly mm. who is going to be a very good writer mm. because they're already a good writer. Mm. They've come to the class because they are passionate about their writing and they know they can write well. And so they're already a good writer. And my role there is to sort of act as a mentor and a support and to help them and to get better, even better. But then there are other people who I think are not very good writers and they need a lot of support and practice. And that's why we give them exercises and get them to do things. But I think it's unrealistic to say at the end of the two year MA, for example, that, that that's those students are necessarily going to be able to produce a, a really good book. Mm -hmm. But it's just a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we have to constantly be saying to people, we can give you techniques, mm -hmm. we can give you ideas, we can, we can give you structure and practices that will help you. But ultimately, you're not going to get it in two years necessarily. You, you might get inspiration and, and, and drive. Um, but please accept that if you want to be a writer, you're going to suffer <laughs> and, and ch be challenged all your life. It's not just something that happens in a creative writing course. Absolutely. And most of the Australian universities who have uh, the creative writing programs in different universities and yeah. Uh, girls. Yeah. But uh, strangely, in India, we don't have creative writing uh, uh, as part of university syllabus these days even. Okay, so there's a school difference in schools, difference in parts, I think. So thank you for your input. Uh, one last question before we move on to very interesting poetry reading session by you. Uh, who are the important contemporary Aussie poets whom you think are you great as good poets, very promising and very established poets, whom you recommend to be read by the Indian readers gosh it's a hard one just in britain i work with a wonderful poet called helen tukey t-o-o-k-e-y mm. and also andrew mcmillan who mm. is a young uh, poet from yorkshire who's now working in manchester um i felt quite um, thrilled to be working with people like this who are doing unusual things with poetry and, and are very fine teachers as well. Their work is worth um, looking at. Um, I can't remember the names of their books off the top of my head. I'm sorry, they've both had books in a year or two. But, but to me, um, these poets are really exciting. I like Kate Middleton in Australia. I think she's a really fine poet. Um, yeah, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because I, I, I think the, the, the uh, uh, poetry also is moving into a whole range of other forms of prose, if you like. Mm. Um, Max Porter's book, Grief is a Thing with Feathers, mm. and also Lanny, they're, they're sort of, you could argue, they're, they're prose to, to some degree, but the poetic behind them is very, very interesting. And grief is a thing with feathers, draws on um, Ted Hughes's poetry. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that idea of poetics as a sort of hybrid thing um, is also a really challenging, a challenging way in which to think about poetry and how you most want to write. Kathy, uh, performance poetry is taking the place of real poetry reading in Australia. So, yeah. uh, how do you find this? No. Performance poetry? Yeah. It's, 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 it's quite interesting to me because when I was, um, when I was young, you know, the, you could get poets reading their poetry on discs and so on. And of course, everybody knows you can find this stuff on YouTube and so on. So for me, listening to T.S. Eliot read his own poems was revelatory. And and um, W. H. Auden or Sylvia Plath or poets that I, I liked a lot and, and you know, grew up on or studied. So to hear them read suddenly gave a whole new meaning and cadence to the work. Mm 
And also some of the poets um, were read, that I heard, were read by famous actors. And sometimes the famous actors were um, better than the poets in a way. So yeah. I was very disappointed when I first heard Dylan Thomas read his poetry because I thought he'd sound, he'd have a strong Welsh accent. I liked poetry read by people with their voice and their, you know, but he didn't speak with that Welsh voice. So, um, and why, you know, his parents probably educated it out of him and, and so on. So, you know, people, people don't always have the voice of the, of the poem, if that makes sense. So, um, but to hear someone like uh, the actor Hugh Griffiths or Richard Burton read poetry, um, with an accent brought something to it. And the same with T.S. Eliot. When you hear T.S. Eliot read Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, you realise this sort of slightly dour voice he has with the wasteland or whatever it suddenly comes into a different realm through those cat poems. So that's why when you go to a, a you know, a, a kind of club or pub or speakeasy or whatever and poets are up there reading their work and performing their work, it's great fun, it's interesting. You hear it, you hear the emphasis and so on. And it also has the ambience of, of, of the shared audience. It's the shared audience of a, a room full of listeners and readers. And I think that's very, very interesting. It's very important, I think, to hear poetry out loud. And, and one of the things I think was is a blessing in a way with children's education when I was growing up, certainly even though at the time they, we probably sounded terrible, was that they would get us to learn it by heart. Yes. It's such a beautiful expression. Now, children, I want you to learn this poem by heart. Yeah. Now, to me, that's like the beating heart of poetry. But also it means you learn it, you repeat it, you reflect on it, you say it. And even if you're saying it badly, like, you know, as children often do, dirge-like poems, um, the, the seed is in your head for the rest of your life. You can hear it, you can, and you, it, 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 it's a rhythm. So, so the privilege to me is, is hearing a poet read their work and to feel the, the poetry from them. That's, that's the, the heart. Wonderful, Kathy, and I think this discussion and your talk will <clears throat> increase interest to work on India Australia poetry partnerships India Australia uh, literary partnerships and also works on you Eddie Hope and beyond. Thank you so much for giving so much so many things as input to this discussion. Thank you, Kathy. We move on to the next part. I think uh, where would you mind this reading three or four poems which are close to your heart. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that is, we're talking about heart. I think in poetry, heart matters a lot. So we are looking forward to listen to you, four of your poems, which represent you as a poet, Catherine Cohn. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to read um, a, a few poems. The, the first one is the longest, it's called Slipstream and it's about Migration. My parents, when they left us, uh, Britain, went to um, Glasgow to catch a boat. And so Slipstream is a poem about people getting a boat to go forever, really, to their new country. Slipstream. She crosses the gangplank, stops, looks back. Beyond the port buildings and cranes, the soft puff of steam from factory stacks are violet-heathered hills far off. Her coat of four winters is tight across her shoulders, lapel run through with a diamante pin. Which way to go, forward or aft? The sky, the hills, the crowd waving them off. Come, Isabel. Her husband snaps. Departure is always pieces of sky, land, water, a rickety gangplank above concrete bollards and straining ropes. Ahead is ocean, here seagulls gloat. Mist wets her face 
She smells oil and polish, roasting meat for their first sea lunch. An hour of waving, the streamers snap, their pallid lemons and pinks, fragile as skin, unraveled as love ties. The gangplank is drawn back, the ropes, the upturned faces, the widening gap, the water dark. She holds her gloved hand to her face as though it might erase the western hills, still heather purple, yielding. The crowded dock grows smaller as water widens. Her children laugh, but on her husband's face is anger and loss. She knows they are on her face too, that there is little between them, a difference as small as that between water and land, old life and new. Come on, she says. And so they traipse downstairs with polished rails, along corridors with too many doors. Below the waterline, their cabin has four bunks, no porthole. Their suitcases are splayed across the floor, trunks in the hold. She could have stayed on deck to watch the Clyde turn to sea, that moment when smooth water becomes this roll and salt descended and the engines churned with a greater purpose. It is later that she notices that birds change too. No longer dock gulls, but seabirds wide of wing, silent in the slip, ship's slipstream. The next poem is just called Leda. Um, obviously the name Leda from the po, uh, from their story about Leda and the Swan. Leda. Faced with a simple truth, you either lurch into the sea, naked as any plucked and pimpled swan, or else you stand and cringe uncouth, maintain that sad position on the shore. I leapt and found the water strangely warm, soft as the feathers of some youthful bird, and joy enough to float. The next one is Animal Dreaming. When the cat is asleep on the fractured yellow cushion, its shape long abandoned to accommodate his. He sighs sometimes as though he has worrying dreams. The cushion sighs too with the shifting weight of his body, a small burden for a deftly reshaped craftsmanship of leather. Cat and cushion, one dreaming in size, the other absorbing something, surely not feline dreams. I am told cats dream of an ancestry of tigers, might leather dream of prairies and fields. And the last one is called Stars. This poem I dedicated to W.H. Auden because he wrote a poem also, Looking Up at the Stars I Know Quite Well, That For All They Care I Can Go To Hill. That's his poem and I love that poem and I just wanted to write something about stars. I read somewhere that stars, we all have within our, our own bodies, our atoms, some aspect, some element of the stars. So I rather was taken with that idea that we are stars ourselves. Looking up at the stars, I know quite well that I am seeing only the memory of them. Starlight is just a trick to draw my eyes up and up, trying to name them, to find the bear or the belt. Some stars hold words in their firmament, cruel, hard, soft, sexy, bereft, star chatter down the light years, star gossip about the shameful and the good, as if condemnation could change anything, a star chamber floating above my head, moments of my own nothingness. <laughs> 
We are related though, those stars and me, and my atoms come from that star and that. And I traverse the sky each night because stars rest in my veins and my heart. My lungs breathe stars, starbursts are my eyes. That they are long extinct bothers me not. They are in me as I fall towards my death. Thank you. Thank you so much, you know, touched, wonderful, fascinating poetry, you know, you read out so well, it reached to the cores of our hearts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kejuli College, for the opportunity. Uh, Honorable Principal, Honorable sir, principal of governing body, body member. And, uh, and, 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 and thank you, Kathleen, Kathy, for making the evening so, so special. Over to Ranjit. Yeah. Okay. Ranjit. Uh, Ranjit. Yes, this has been a fascinating session. And on behalf of all the listeners and participants, I wholeheartedly thank Professor Cole and Dr. Sharangi for this engrossing uh, exchange. And I especially thank Professor Cole for those touching points. Uh, Professor Cole's talk has provoked uh, several questions, and some of them were addressed during the, on, in the course of the conversation. Uh, but I would request the chairman and the dignified speakers to allow me to uh, please some of those questions uh, so that they can be suitably addressed. Should I should I go on, Professor Cole? Yes, please. Yes, please. All right. So uh, there has been a question on uh, on meter. You have talked about the metronomic and musical qualities of poetry, and a question. There is a question about poetry nowadays. Poetry nowadays usually doesn't follow the strict metrical norms as it did in earlier times. Could you kind of reflect on this and perhaps also weave in your um, your your views about contemporary trends in poetry. Hmm. That's, an That's an interesting question. question. And, and, and thank you, and to, thank you to, to whoever asked that. Um, I think it's it's difficult. When I when I talk about the metronomic quality, I, I, I'm not I'm not terrific. At, you know, sort of thinking. Well, right, I'm going to write a sonnet, or I'm going to write in. Um, iambic pentameter or, or what have you. I don't think, my sense is that um, for, for so many of us, free verse offers a different way of writing. And I mean, it's been around for, for, for a long time, but that, that idea that we, we just allow the words to form themselves on the page in a particular way, where the, where the rhymes or the rhythms come within the, the, the structure of the sentence, not necessarily um, through through rhyming words with a sort of A B or A B B A rhyme and so on, but but through a kind of rhythmic resonance through the ways in which words are placed, I I always think that a kind of metronomic quality creeps into all sorts of writing, not just poetry actually. And I get students to think about this. When I'm writing prose, this happens too, and perhaps that's why prose poetry is, is and free verse are so much more appealing to us in contemporary forms. There, there's, this, there's a sort of beat that gets into your head. I, I presume other people have this as well. That, that feeling in your head that something is moving, it's a musicality that is just there. It's very important in poetics, I think, to to be open to that. And so even if you're writing uh, narrative poetry or, or, or free verse poetry where there is not necessarily a particular structure, the, 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 the movement, the sound, the feel, the beat of the, of the poem comes through in, in, in those kinds of ways. So that what I would call metronomic is being open to that something that just sort of drives it. Virginia Woolf talked about it in her in her writing as well, this feeling in something like the waves that that the, there is a kind of 
rhythm and beat that comes through the work. I don't know if that answers, but I think that, um, you know, there are poets who, are, you know, we, we do still write with rhyme and, and, and uh, structure and so on, but, but I think we're more open in a way to that kind of wider freedom within the, the way we write. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, uh, there is another question. Uh, this is, um, we are all curious about your encounters with uh, Indian poetry, especially with poets, Indian poets like Tagore. Um, have you read Indian poets? And no, what are your views about them? I don't know a lot, I don't know a lot of Indian poetry, Indian poetry oh. at all. And uh, I'd be very interested to know a lot more. And I, I think also the idea that, that of, of the ways in which cultural patterns and musicality play out and, and, and so on in, in poetics, that would, would interest me a lot. Um, when I was in Vietnam, I, I interviewed a range of poets and talked to poets there about their work and generationally that was very interesting and I imagine it's the same in India as well. That, that politics and culture and influences are, are different in different generations and so on. But I have to say apologetically, I'm not familiar with a lot of Indian poetry. And I know I'm going to hear, going to hear and I hope, and I hope to hear recommendations. recommendations. <laughs> right. Uh, the, uh, you had discussed about uh, some female poets. For example, you had talked about Tuki or Kate Middleton. Uh, there yeah. has been a question on uh, your views about how feminism and gender issues shape modern poetry. Mm. Oh. That's a hard one. I think is there, I, I think questions of, of sexuality and gender and so on have always shaped poetry. I think that, you know, the, the poet I mentioned, Louise Labay, who was writing furious poetry in the 16th, 15th, 16th century um, about her lover um, says a lot about the fact that we have always had women who have written openly and actively about their, 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 their lives and their, their frustrations and anger and so on. Is, it, is contemporary poem, poetry shaped more by that today? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I suppose there's greater freedom now to talk about uh, sexuality and uh, sexual preference and transgender and so on issues. And I, I, I think that's very important. But, but it's a hard one, isn't it? Because I, I, I look back at those Labé poems or poetry that, you know, Sappho or, or the Victorians or, or the early 20th century poet Sylvia Plath. Um, I think women have a capacity to capture the the great the great things of their lives in in very impressive ways. So, and I just think contemporary poets are, are doing the same. And uh, yeah, I, 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 it sounds a bit lame my answer. I'm sorry, but I I do think that you know women are still struggling. We're still talking about things like the gender pay gap and. Uh, sexual assault, domestic violence, all of these things are coming to the fore more and more too here in Britain because of people being in quarantine or in lockdown and the, uh, the politics of the, the, the coronavirus has been major and women are very worried about that and I think also about, you know, the ecological and um, climate change factors that those themes of protecting your young or the future generations and so on, which have been themes in women's poetry since time immemorial, are also now themes about protecting the earth and all of those generations subsequently who are going to be very badly, uh, very badly um, affected by what's happening in the world. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Cole and Dr. Sharangi for engaging in this thought-provoking session. And I hope your explorations of poetry, um, which uh, Professor Cole describes in a book, uh, 
as a lifelong dedication to words uh, would continue and would enrich us in future years. Uh, thanks a lot. Be with us in our future endeavors, ma'am and sir. Um, our program has been quite a fruitful one, and I hope that you all have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, we are now drawing towards the conclusion of our program. Um, all the participants are requested to fill in the feedback forms. Uh, the link to the forms would be given on the Google Meet and YouTube Live platforms. I would now request Dr. Gautam Dondopat, respected coordinator, IQAC, Kejuri College, to deliver a vote of thanks. Dr. Dondopat, please, sir. Thank you, Rungi. It has been an enthralling Sunday evening. And as the coordinator of IQC Khejuri College, I thank you all for making the program successful. We sincerely thank Mr. Ranujit Mondal, President, Governing Body Khejuri College, to be kind enough to inaugurate today's event and for always encouraging us. We are indebted to Dr. Asim Kumar Manna, River Principal, Kejuri College, who guides us in all our efforts. I am thankful to the honorable members of governing body and IQAC for their support in organizing the event. We are very grateful to Professor Catherine Cole, Liverpool John Moores University, UK, and University of Wollongong, Australia, for gracing the present occasion with her luminous presence. Her talk, as well as her readings, will be encouraged, uh, treasured by us. We heartily thank Dr. Jayadeep Sharangi, Principal, New Alipur College, Kolkata, for being kind enough to find time for us and involves in an engaging conversation with Professor Cole, who is we have all enjoyed. We thank the participants who have attended the event and have involved in fruitful dialogue with our speakers. A special thanks goes to the faculty members, staff, and students of our college for participating in the event we organize we recognize the efforts of the students union khejuri college who have supported all our academic activities i must also mention with gratefulness the members of the technical support Team. We have facilitated, who have facilitated us, our program. I personally thank all the teachers and students of English department, especially the convener, Dr. Rangit Chenguptu, head department of English, for making the event a successful one. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Principal. Sir. Thank, thank, you, Kathy. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you from India. Thank you from India. Thank you, ma'am. Take care. Right more. Take care. Right more. Yeah. Looking forward. Thank you, Kajuri College. Honorable Principal, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Subankar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.